record right now, so we are recording this um, for posterity. Um, we are providing this in webinar format. So for those of you who are used to Zoom where you go on for a meeting, um, your, um, uh, your um, cameras are, are not going to be on and you're going to be automatically muted. Um, please use the chat or the question box, either if you have technical problems or if um, you want to ask a question. Um, Grace uh, Harmon, who is our communications manager, will be, hi, hi Grace, um, will, be manning, um, will be manning those while I'm giving the talk. So she can help you with any problems that you're having. Um, and um, just so we can keep to our half hour format, we're gonna just save questions for the end. It'll, I think it'll just be a little bit easier um, to do that. Um, and uh, I think we have some really great images and I think um, it can be a little distracting to see all the talking heads. So I'm going to stop my video. Um, you're just going to see um, our logo. Um, and uh, while I give the talk, when we come back for questions, I'll, I'll give you my face again. Um, but um, uh, don't worry um, when you see me go away. I'm doing that on purpose. So, all right, folks. So, um, I really think the arch is a point of pride for what we like to call Washington Square Parkies. Um, it's really a world class monument and it re really lends a unique and I would say a somewhat formal tone to what I think of as a very bohemian park. Um, so, um, you know, this could be a two hour lecture easily. I'm trying to keep to the half hour format. So today what I wanna talk about with the arch um, is how it came to be. Why is it here? Um, who were the people who made it possible? Um, and who are the artis artisans who had a hand in creating it? And then as we get to the end, I really wanna talk about the context of the time in which it was created, because I think there were a lot of things going on in New York City at the time that really kind of, um, I guess it really kind of um, uh, tells us a lot about the time in, in which it was created. So, we'll go to our first slide here. There we go. So, uh, just as the arch was a point of pride today, it was really a point of pride when it was first built. Um, and it was built twice. So, um, this is the first arch that you're looking at. Um, it was conceived as part of celebrations taking place in New York City for um, honoring the uh, 100th year anniversary, the centennial of our um, first president, Washington, which Washington Square Park is named for, um, his first inauguration at Federal Hall. And Federal Hall is a building um, uh, now now no longer here, um, that, uh, uh, that served as the, the capital of the United States um, in 1789 during, uh, sorry, in um, 1789 when uh, our, our country was uh, first founded. Um, so 100 years later in 1880, 1899 and actually in 1888 as we're gearing up for celebrations, a man named William Rhine Rhinelander Stewart is a park neighbor. He's a philanthropist and he was able to convince the city who was planning a parade as part of the centennial to change the route to go by Washington Square. Um, and basically by saying he would erect an, an arch, a triumphal arch, um, and would get private funds to pay for it. So uh, there were several other uh, triumphal arches being planned for this centennial parade. Uh, the, um, there, were, um, there was one downtown and there were two at, um, located near Fifth Avenue and Madison Square, um, where the reviewing stand for the parade was located. Stewart tapped rising architect Stanford White, um, who later went on to the firm um, McKinn, Mead and White, uh, to design the arch. The first arch was made of uh, wood and plaster was smaller, it was more slender, as you can see in this picture here, um, than our current arch. And it was located about 100 feet north of the square. And it spanned Fifth Avenue. And incidentally, um, it um, uh, abutted the property of the Rhinelander family um, on that west side of Washington Square North. And it cost $2,500, so $2,500 uh, to build. And I'm just gonna show you a slightly different view in a different season of the arch. Um, you can see clearly the statue of uh, Washington at the top. 
you can see an eagle very much unlike the eagle that's on our arch today, but you can see some of the same um, types of, of, of imagery um, that you see now. Um, but this arch was such a success uh, during the parade. Uh, it really was uh, much, much better than the arches at Madison Square. And the community liked it so much, there were calls to build a permanent arch. So um, Stanford White was tapped once again to design it. And our friend William Rhinelander Stewart was named secretary of the, and I quote, Committee on Erection of the Washington Arch at Washington Square. So, here's a fun, fun picture of the groundbreaking at the arch. You can see Stanford White right in the middle with the bowler hat and uh, William Ryan Lander Stewart is two away from him um, to the right on this picture with the tall top hat. Um, White, had many connections with artisans in his work as an art architect. Um, and he brought many that were already in his circle um, to work on the carvings on the marble arch. And um, the, the, the arch is carved um, in what's called Tuckahoe marble. Um, and it is um, uh, named for where it was quarried in very nearby Tuckahoe, New York. And um, I'm gonna take you now, um, this is 1890, I'm gonna take you now to 1892, if I can get this slide to move, there we go. Um, in 1892, um, of, uh, you get a close up on some of the uh, detailed carvings and you'll see, um, I like to think of this as suits on the, on the scaffolding. Um, you can see, uh, you can see Stan, uh, sorry, you can see William Rhinelander Stewart right in the middle with that tall top hat and, uh, and Stanford White right to his right. Um, but you get a really good view of, uh, of some of the carvings here. Um, so um, Philip Martiny uh, was the uh, artisan who carved the eagles on the keystones and those are on both the north and the south sides of the arch. Uh, a sculptor named Frederick McMoneys was uh, um, employed to uh, carve the frieze. You'll see along the frieze the stars for our first 13 colonies and states, the W's for Washington. And you'll also note in this picture, I think this is a really great picture, the, um, the uh, triangular spandrels are not carved yet. Um, these are the angel figures. Um, that, uh, that you'll, I'll just move to the next picture so you can see them, the angel figures that are both on the north side and the south side of the arch. It's really fun to see them not, not yet carved. So the statuary that we're so familiar with on the north side of the arch uh, took a little bit longer to build. They were always planned from the beginning, but fundraising really delayed their, com their completion. Um, on the east side, and I'll show you, there we go. On the east side is um, uh, Washington, accompanied by fame and valor, sculpted by Herman McNeil. It was completed in 1916. Um, the statue is often uh, called Washington at War or Washington as Commander in Chief, but in fact its uh, formal name is Washington, accompanied by fame and valor. Um, and I really love our last picture here, um, our next picture here. Um, this is um, a drawing of the West Pier statue. This is a concept drawing. Um, you know, a lot of the same uh, imagery coming into the final, final design, but um, some changes, not as much relief in the original. So the West Pier, um, which was completed in 1918, um, is by Sterling, um, excuse me, Alexander Sterling Calder. Um, and uh, m folks will call, call this statue Washington at Peace, Washington as President. I've even heard Washington as Statesman. Um, but its full name is Washington Accompanied by Wisdom and Justice. 
And obviously here the um, Washington is in the front and wisdom and justice is in the back, just like on the East Pier where um, fame and valor flank Washington. So indeed the symbolism on the arch is striking um, to me, particularly in its nationalism. So we have the federal, state, and city state seals adorning each pier. We have the stars representing the first states. The eagle, of course, is our national bird. And the statues of Washington, which represent him really during the Revolutionary War, Washington as commander in chief, and as Washington as our first president. And of course, the arch was built to celebrate the inauguration of our country's first president. But I'd like to consider other things taking place in, in New York City at the time. So, okay. Um, with the centennial, there's definitely going to be nationalistic fervor. Um, uh, we'll, we'll be thinking back to our country's founding. But what I'd like to explore now is how immigration had drastically changed New York City's population um, at this time, particularly beginning in the mid 1800s, but really through, um, really through 1920, the city's population swells with um, immigrants from all areas, um, the Irish, the French, um, even Spanish, um, but particularly south of Washington Square Park, um, Italian immigrants um, really changed the, the, the tenor of the neighborhood. Um, and they're um, arriving to New York City and their um, biggest populations coming in between 1880 and 1920. And, not only are they changing who is living in the neighborhood, but they're really changing the architecture and the density of you know, what was once a fairly stately neighborhood, a genteel neighborhood. In fact, the first monument to be erected in Washington Square Park is none other than that of Garibaldi um, on the east side, um, who is known as the Uniter of Italy. Um, and uh, that statue was indeed erected by um, by the Italian American community. That's where the funds for um, that statue uh, come from. So I don't wanna spend a ton of time on Garibaldi and I'm not showing you his picture because we're here to talk about the arch, but um, the arch itself was built during what was called the City Beautiful Movement. And the City Beautiful Movement was really a model of city planning. And it sought to really engender moral and social uplift through inspiring city, civic architecture. And if you think about um, living in a tenement um, with um, not a lot of space and a lot of neighbors and a lot of family, um, and you think about um, conditions in the 1890s, not all these buildings had uh, running water, not all of them had toilet facilities inside. Um, you know, putting art in public spaces um, bringing beauty to um, outdoor shared spaces was really kind of a kind of inspiring model, um, if, you, if, if you would like to call it that. Um, so our friend William Rhinelander Stewart, who um, gives us the arch, um, was also president of the New York State Board of Charities. So he really wouldn't have been a stranger to the changing character of the neighborhood, and he wouldn't be a stranger to the needs of the new immigrant class. Um, and what I'm about to say in no way denigrates um, Stuart, who gives us such a beautiful monument and who takes part in, you know, this idea of bringing um, beautiful architecture and art to public spaces for our new class of citizens. But perhaps there's also a touch of paternalism in the idea of needing to socially uplift um, this new group of American citizens. Um, and this idea of bringing the founding ideals of our country maybe could be seen a little bit as indoctrination, you know, that, that melting pot that, you know, learn to, learn to uh, appreciate what this country is about. And perhaps it's also a way to, um, to dictate the character of the square. Um, so um, bringing a sense of formality um, to maybe what had become a bit of a playground um, for the folks that needed fresh air. Um, and this all leads me to um, the last set of artisans that I would like to talk about who worked on the arch. And those artisans, if I can get my slide, come on slide, whoop. Um, if I can get my slide, uh, those artisans are the Pichirilli family. 
So the Picciarelli family um, arrives as immigrants from the Tuscany region of Italy in 1888. Um, the family is comprised of Giuseppe, the father, his wife, a daughter, and six sons. Um, and I'm going to read you their names, Ferruccio, Attilio, Forio, Massionello, Razio, Getulio. All six, as well as their father, were trained as marble cutters and carvers. And the area that they come from in Tuscany is near the quarries of uh, Carrara, um, as in Carrara mar marble. And the Picciarelli brothers um, are tapped to work on some of the uh, some of the carvings um, along with their um, the, the masters, quote unquote. Um, so um, McMoney's and um, and the like. Um, but the brothers sculpt the 95 rosettes um, in the coffered ceiling of the arch from big blocks of marble in place. So I'm showing you this, um, this photo I like to jokingly call suits on the scaffold. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm showing you this because this is where the Picciarelli brothers were when they carved the rosettes in place on scaffolding overhead, um, which is uh, to me a mighty achievement. So the brothers establish a studio in the Mott Haven section of the Bronx, and they really go on to work on an incredibly important um, New York-based um, and American monuments, um, including uh, the Lions, um, the Lions at the New York uh, Public Library, Patience and Fortitude, the 11 figures in the pediment of the New York Stock Exchange building, and probably most notably, um, it is uh, link, uh, they carved Lincoln in the Lincoln Memorial by Daniel Chester French and for Daniel Chester French. And thank you, um, thank you, Grace, for spelling Picciarelli and I'll have, I think I have their name up in, a, in my next slide. Um, so the Picciarelli brothers really arrive on this scene, um, the City Beautiful movement. Um, at particularly the right time. And I just want to show you this quote from um, the American um, Magazine of Art, um, which says um, in 1921 of the brothers' work that it celebrates the natural bond between art and craftsmanship. They have brought us from their native land the whole art and craft and science and business of freeing the angel from the stone. Um, a former curator at the Met, um, a former cur curator of sculpture, even notes that the, the arrival of the Picciarelli brothers really frees up um, other American artists, this um, having to sculpt in stone, um, that, they could, um, that they, they could just sculpt in, uh, in clay and have the Picciarelli brothers um, uh, kind of translate their work into the stone. Um, and in fact, um, their work with, um, with Daniel Ch Chester French really, um, really shows that relationship. So for me, it's really fitting um, that, uh, that Italian immigrants, masters of their craft, um, basically come to work on a monument that was created during a time of nationalistic fervor, thinking about the origins of our country, um, and when established Americans were thinking about changes going on in, um, in society and culture, and, uh, and uh, kind of gave us what is really a, a, a sculptor that today um, is a point of pride uh, for the neighborhood um, and certainly for New York City. Okay, I think I, I think I finished very early. Actually, that took a lot. That took a lot longer in practice. So um, I'm going to um, start up my video again. Hi everyone, um, and oop, excuse me, and oh, excuse me. Um, I'd like to just uh, open it up to questions.
How are we doing, Grace? Anything there? As of right now, we don't have any questions in the box other than uh, Betsy's great question about how to actually spell the name. Um, but I have, I have a question. Yes. Do we know how long all of the, their carving work took them? How long were they up on that scaffolding? Sure. Well, the arch was built from 1890 to 1892. Um, it wasn't dedicated until 1895. Um, but so seemingly um, they couldn't sculpt it until, until it was built. Um, but um, so two years at the most. Um, now granted there, um, there were the, the master sculptors and the master artisans. Um, and they rendered a lot of the work, um, but uh, um, they, um, but somewhere in in the span of two years, it took them. So, not too well, not too shabby. I also wanted to share with everyone uh, one of my favorite little pieces of trivia about the carvings on the arch. Um, the angels that are on there were supposed to look like the wives of uh, William Rhinelander Stewart and Sanford White. And uh, they, they went through a few iterations with the faces because they just couldn't keep couldn't get them right. So uh, eventually they, they gave up. So I don't think they look like anyone, but I always found that funny. <laughs> um, we have two questions now. Mm -hmm. uh, what part of Tuscany were the brothers from? Yes, so um, they were located near the Carrara um, uh, uh, quarries. And has uh, the arch ever been damaged or repaired? Yes, um, so that could be a whole other talk. Um, but it was in fact the rosettes falling in the late um, 1990s that um, prompted the city to, uh, to complete a restoration of the arch from 2000, um, 2000 to 2002, I believe. Um, and um, many of the rosettes actually had to be cast. So they took a, um, you know, these were all originally carved in place. So they're each unique um, up until the restoration um, in the early 2000s, um, where they take a, rosette that is carved um, and in good shape and they cast it and so they create the um, the the rosettes that have fallen and are in bad repair out of a, a, a good a, a rosette in good shape um, and so um, we actually do know which of the rosettes are <laughs> are are replaced and which are not some are also in okay shape and only pieces of them were recast. Um, and if anyone's interested, I can share um, the report um, with them. Um, it's something, Grace, that we can just include when we share the slides. Does that yeah, sound good? Sure. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So we have two questions that are, uh, oh, we've got one more quick question about the rosettes before we <laughs> move on from that. How did they reattach them? Ah, uh, so that would be a question for someone who actually works in stone. Um, that is not an area of uh, conservation that I'm very familiar with. Um, if people are interested, we can ask um, we can ask John Krawchuk, who is currently head of the Historic House Trust, uh, to come on and talk a little bit about that process. He was in charge of the Monuments Division of Parks then and um, oversaw that restoration, and he. Um, uh, a few years ago gave a great talk for our volunteers, our greater volunteers, um, about that process. Um, my guess is um, uh, it's, you know, a type of glue that, you know, works with stone or maybe some type of mortar, but um, we might even know if we take a look at that uh, document I was referencing. Um, they might have included materials in that. So we have two uh, somewhat related questions. So I'm gonna ask them together. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, is there a secret room at the top of the arch? Mm -hmm. And uh, was that side level, street level secret side door uh, leading upstairs part of the original design? Uh, and has it ever been regularly used as uh, an entertaining space? Yeah, so I was actually going to include that as part of this talk, but I, 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 I was worried about running out of time. So yes, there is a room at the top of the arch 
And yes, the staircase was included from its first, um, when it, from when it was first built. Um, the, um, but it's not secret. Um, so uh, basically the room is behind the frieze. So that's that area of the arch that you're looking at with the W's and the wreaths encircled stars. Um, so behind the eagle, um, and that is, um, it is, you know, the arch is not solid. Um, it's not solid marble. Um, and so uh, the room is what you get when you have that space um, that, that spans the, the ceiling there. Um, um, so a solid piece of marble would have been so much more expensive and engineering wise, I'm not sure if it would have worked. So um, the, um, the uh the room um gives you access up into the roof um quote unquote room gives you access up to the roof um it was always built um it was built from the beginning so that there was access to um basically to check on the uh check on the structure um and um i actually have gone up which was super exciting and i went up with um uh, uh, an architect that worked for New York City Parks that was doing some repairs uh, to the roof. Um, and so that's how I got to go up and see. Um, it is pretty cool, um, but it, all, it is also not meant for, um, not meant for regular use. Um, the stairs are quite narrow. Um, they're, it's, it's very, uh, <laughs> it's very circular. Um, it's also very delicate. Um, and the roof itself is quite delicate. Um, and so um, it's, uh, the Parks Department has um, felt for that for the um, safety of the monument, for safety of people, um, that it is not meant for public use. So I think that, I think that answers that one. <laughs> we have four more questions. I'm mm -hmm. gonna call these our last four since okay. we are coming close to being out of time, but they're okay. all good questions. And if know. anyone wants to hang over the edge, we're happy at yes. the end, we're happy to stay on. <laughs> In case you couldn't tell, we really love talking about this stuff. So um, can we talk about the role that Edith Lyons would have had? Did she have a role with the arch? Um, I don't believe Edith Lyons had a role with the arch. Um, I think what I'm remembering is she did, and this ties into another question we have oh. about when uh, vehicular traffic stopped driving under the arch. I believe she was involved in that. Yeah, um, in yeah, she's not the name that most people will talk about when, um, let me just, um, and I'm sorry, it's so hard to move the slides in this program, but I just want to bring you back to an earlier slide where you saw the way traffic um, kind of interacted with the park. Um, I think well, this is very old traffic, but um, uh, traffic. here um, I want to show you. Um, so um, from as early as 1870, um, there were roads uh, through Washington Square Park and you're looking at the roads here and you can see kind of the, the area that's not meant to be driven on in the middle of this picture. Um, and the roads were meant first to accommodate carriages and then later cars. In 1957 um, is when the last car uh, went through Washington Square Park. A few years later, um, even buses um, um, uh, were redirected um, from use. And that whole campaign that lasted almost 10 years to stop traffic through the park um, was led by a woman named Shirley Hayes. Um, I think Edith Lyons would have been con a contemporary of Shirley Hayes, um, but don't quote me on that. Um, but um, Shirley Hayes really led the efforts to, um, to stop traffic in Washington Square Park. You'll often hear Jane Jacobs associated with this. Especially uh, after Marvelous Miss Maisel. Yes, um, but uh, the, um, but the, uh, uh, but it was really Shirley Hayes who uh, who worked to um, to stop uh, traffic through the park, and it um, that was the late 50s, and it wasn't until um, 1970 that there was finally a redesign of the park where the road beds were taken out, um, and it became pedestrian path only. 
So we have a, a question, which came first, the arch or the fountain? Um, and why was the fountain misaligned for years? Which also leads into a request we have for mm -hmm. a talk about the fountain. Just okay. that we'll so, like this one. We'll yes, put that we can, on the list. Yes, we can certainly do that. Um, so um, the, uh, the fountain came first. Um, the fountain was actually the first piece of, I, we'll call it architecture, um, in Washington Square Park. Um, just like our arch is not the first arch, our current fountain is not our first fountain. Um, and uh, um, well, that's a whole other talk, but in the 1850s, the fountain was added to, um, in 1852, uh, the fountain is added to the park. Um, and fountains are added across New York City parks at this time in celebration of a very important uh, uh, engineering feat that we really don't give enough credit to today because we take it for granted, but that is running water. Um, the Croton Aqueduct is completed in the 18, 1840s and city fountains really become the celebration of this uh, new technological miracle running water. So, um, and then in 1870, when we get our first roads, that's when we get our second and current fountain. So we'll, we'll save that for the larger talk. <laughs> And uh, we have one final question, unless anyone's got a few more that they want to include, but were um, all of the statues done by stone carvers from plaster casts provided by the artists, or were some of them carved by the sculptors in the stone that's the monument now? Yeah, so most of the, and let me just um, take you to um, another slide here. You can see um, in this slide here the pla um, the marble is in place um, in the um, in the spandrels there, the the triangular area. Let me just see if I can. There's a way to annotate. Let me see if I can do that. Here we go. <laughs> um, so you can see the the spandrels here waiting to be carved in place. Most of the um, most of the uh, the frieze, the spandrels, um, the obviously the coffered ceiling were carved in place. I believe the eagles were not carved, um, but I have not seen references to plaster casts on those. Um, uh, the, um, the 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 statues of Washington, um, um, from everything that I've seen, were carved out outside of the park and then added. And they're different marble. They're, they're different stone yes. than the rest of the arch, correct? They're, they're yes. over marble. Not over like marble, that. yeah, whereas the arch is Tuckahoe marble, yeah. Which is right. not great for carving. Um, it was selected because it's a very beautiful stone, but it can be kind of crumbly. It's, um, very, it's, a, it's a wide grain stone, and so it's very porous. And so for those of you who are around um, in the 1990s, there, um, before the, the restoration, there was a lot of biological growth. Um, unfortunately, um, during the 80s and 90s, when there was a lot of graffiti um, on the arch, um, there, they would paint it, um, which isn't the best way to deal with stone. Um, and so, you know, some of the some of the human uh, <laughs> human consequences of not taking care of the stone quite well um, were problematic, and I have to say, New York City Parks has done a great job of um, has done a great job of maintaining the arch ever since the restoration. They come in once a year. Um, Grace will normally post pictures on the uh, on our social media when they come in to clean um, video when I can get it. They, uh, yeah. they pressure wash. It's very cool. And then they seal it. Um, and if, and I'm gonna go back, just, um, hold on, I have to get rid of this annotate thing. Um, ooh, technology. <laughs> I'm just gonna go back to um, our last slide here at the end, because I think it shows, um, you can see a little bit, if you look actually where my blue annotation is right there, you can see the netting um, that, that they put around uh, some of the, the, the pieces of the arch, and that's to, um, keep pigeons from from roosting um, because they can really do a number on the stone. So, yeah. okay, that looks Grace, like that's the last of our questions. Great. Well, I'd like to thank everyone um, for uh, joining me today. Um, we love talking about the park, and while we're here um, uh, in the pause, you know, we hope we can 
you know, kind of bring the park to you. Um, it's, uh, it's, I think it's bittersweet that the weather is so beautiful and um, some of us are far away. We know some of us are close, but you know, not comfortable going out, and, um, being careful about social distancing, which good for you. Um, uh, we, we hope uh, everyone that goes into the park is careful about social distancing and um, paying attention to the rules and being safe. But um, while this is happening, we just want to connect with you and um, please let us know if there's other topics. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we'll send out the recording of this along with the materials uh, and the archaeology report. Um, and uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a good Thursday. Bye-bye.